Today we're going to talk about basic regression analysis with time series data. Where are we in the course? We have just talked about heteroscedasticity and this material here uh, is based on chapter 10 of Wooldridge's book Introduction to Econometrics. Let me start with um, these three examples of um, time series plots. What you always see here is um, time on the horizontal axis, here, here, and here. Then you know, uh, you see that um, you can um, show time series data in various ways, either with bars or with a line. Um, but in the end of the day, what you do see is development over time. What is this? For instance, this dark red line is the total supply of oil. This dark blue line is um, the price of oil over time. Same here, um, supply dark red, price light blue. What's interesting in this right plot here is um, that we see not only um, the supply or production of oil here in Libya, but we also see uh, in red here um, various things um, that have happened and that do at least partly explain why it changed over time. These three plots are taken from The Economist, as you can see in the bottom. This example here is for financial markets. So what um, uh, the authors of this paper here have done is um, they have looked at a lot of announcements um, on the stock market. Basically, um, you know when the announcement takes place and what they studied was how the stock price reacted to positive news. What you see here on the horizontal axis is the days before and after the announcement. So zero is the dividend announcement day. So what you see is actually it's an announcement about the dividend. Zero is the announcement day. Minus two is two days before, three days before, four days before and so on. Um, and what you see plotted is what is called cumulative returns. Um, so what you do there is um, you take the returns on one day. So from here, then you have 5%. And then, you know, you start here and you add from this point here the returns on the day after the announcement and you add it and basically you do it to construct this line. What you do see is that there is a big systematic movement uh, that is driven by the dividend announcement and before and after it's kind of flat. Okay, so what this tells us is um, uh, that there is uh, no systematic movement basically. Uh, so um, 12 days before the announcement and two days before the announcement, the stock price is more or less the same. And also here you see after the, uh, after the dividends, after the good news have been shared, um, the stock price jumps up. And then um, 12 days later, um, it is more or less at the same level as it was right after jumping up. Third example here. Um, is taken from Schiller's uh, contribution here, 1981. What you see here is two uh, time series. One is um, what the stock market did, and that would be the blue line, that's denoted by P. And then you have a dashed line, and you can think of the dashed line as you know the fundamental underlying value. Uh, of the uh, of of what is traded on the stock market, 
So Schiller's point is always that there is some extra um, variance on the stock market driven by all kinds of ways in which um, actors interact. And then his big um, theme is bubbles, basically. Is it rational to act in that way? Is it not? That's a big debate. And the last example uh, is taken from the New York Times from 2010. What they have plotted here is um, a time series of couples breaking up. And normally that's not so easy to uh, measure. But um, here what they've done is to look at Facebook updates. Back then um, many people shared their relationship status still on Facebook. And what you do see here is what one can see from that. And um, what you see is clear seasonality. Okay, so um, you see here uh, how many people broke up at various points in time. And um, in blue, you do see events um, that took place at that point in time. And what you do see is, for instance, that on Christmas Day, not so many people break up shortly before Christmas. A lot of people break up. Okay, you see a spike on April's, April Fool's Day. Um, here you see that on Mondays, more people break up slightly more during the summer holidays. Spring break is definitely um, a peak. And Valentine's Day is also a tiny, tiny peak. Okay, so you see seasonality. And in some sense, what you see here is that it's predictable how many people will break up because you do know when these things take place. April Fool's Day is always on April 1st. So thinking about all these examples as a whole, um, what we can conclude is that there's some distinguishing features of time series data. First of all, the chronological ordering of data doesn't matter. So um, on the horizontal axis, you always had time. And obviously, it's important um, uh, to, to, to think about this in terms of the evolution of something. And if you think about the evolution of something, uh, then it does mean uh, that uh, the ordering of data matters. So it matters um, what time an observation is for. Juxtapose this to cross-section data. There, it doesn't really matter whether you call one individual, individual i is equal to five and another individual i is equal to six. You can just as well exchange um, uh, those i's um, in terms of the numbering. It does not matter at all for your regression analysis. Here, it does matter. Second thing, there, is, there might be dependence across time. So that does mean that when there's something happening today, it might lead to something, it might be related to something happening tomorrow. Okay, uh, so uh, these two things are related uh, to one another. And the third thing is dependence on time. Uh, this would be seasonal effects. Uh, so at various moments in time, um, certain things might happen or might be more likely to happen. Trends, seasonal effects. Now, technically, um, what we say is that a time series data set is a realization of a so-called stochastic process. And this time series process is often dependent and maybe non-stationary. I could talk for a while about um, exact definitions of these two um, things. Uh, dependence, roughly speaking, is this correlation over time and non-stationary, uh, roughly speaking, means that what is happening uh, at a given moment in time is drawn from a distribution and that distribution will change over time. Now, then um, we're going to have to think about um, inference at some point and um, 
what, what the way of thinking here is, is that repeated sampling from the population of all its possible realizations of such a stochastic process induces randomness of estimators and other time series statistics. And um, then through some uh, rather, um, you know, uh, involved arguments sometimes, um, you can uh, derive um, uh, properties of estimators. And we will not really go uh, into detail uh, here. I'm just going to give you the flavor of all this. Um, but technically, this is um, what's going on and how people talk about this. I have um, now divided up the remaining material into these um, uh, four uh, parts. Uh, we have seen examples of time series regression models. Um, now we're going to look at finite sample properties of OLS under a set of assumptions. Um, this will be the core, let's say. Then we're going to talk about spurious regressions, a spurious regression, and uh, we are going to end this um, by talking about trends and seasonality. Oh, actually, uh, I have shown you examples, and um, these examples were in terms of uh, figures. What I will still show you now um, is uh, examples of models um, written down uh, in terms of regression equations. Good. Uh, so um, the first example is um, static models. In static models, what we have is a contemporaneous so-called contemporaneous relation between y, the variable um, that we see, that we want to predict, and predictor z. Okay, so um, what you see here is that y at time t is a linear function um, of z. And this looks pretty much like the bivariate model. There's an error term, there's a z. Uh, the only difference really is that the i is replaced by a t. Um, what does contemporaneous mean? Contemporaneous really means that what is happening here at t for y um, depends on the value of z at time t. And obviously um, this logic directly extends to more uh, explanatory variables, so, so you can have multiple z's here. Okay, one example is bond yields. Um, might you know you might be able to predict bond yields at time t um, uh, using uh, inflation at time t and whether or not quantitative easing was at place. And quantitative easing um, is um, something the central bank is doing these days. Um, let me not going to talk about it, but it does have an impact on bond yields. The second example is a so-called finite distributed lag model. Okay, uh, so um, let's say we look at finite means not infinite. Uh, so, you know, uh, you need an order, like how many uh, lags Let's say there's an order Q, okay? So that means that I'm gonna have Q lags of the explanatory variables that will affect Y. What, what, what does that all mean? Well, it means that Y at time T is a linear function of ZT today. So this would be that contemporaneous effect that we just had, but actually also the Zs of the past will have an impact up to Q periods in the past. Therefore, it's of order Q, I'm gonna have Q lags, okay? Besides, I do have an error term, so the model is, in a way, a direct extension of the model we had before. What is the example that uh, Wooldridge talks about in his book, one of the examples? It would be the effects of person, personal exemption uh, on fertility rates. 
what would you have here? On the left hand side, you have the fertility rate. The fertility rate is saying how many people uh, have children, basically give birth to children and the personal exemption, that's that's a tax benefit. Okay, so when you have children, um, this, this is how much um, uh, the state gives you in terms of a tax benefit. That's a financial incentive uh, that makes it financially uh, more attractive to have children, if you like. Okay, um, and what you see here is that um, the fertility rate today depends on the tax benefit today, but also on tax benefits that were in place in the previous year and in the year before that. What would be the story? Well, the story would be that um, it takes people time to uh, react uh, to changes. So if two years ago, um, for some reason, the tax system was changed, um, then you might see effects of that today. Okay, so two periods ago, something changed and the effect of that is delta two and that will be the effect on the fertility rate. Again, you have an immediate impact um, and that will be delta naught and you have these delta j's uh, that summarize um, how uh, the impact basically takes place over time. What you can also do is you can think about a long run impact of a permanent change in z and that long run impact when you think about it will basically be that uh, this PE changes in all periods so um, the long run effect is just the sum of all the deltas um, that you have in your model. And obviously um, when I talk about that you immediately see that this extends uh, to more than one uh, uh, basically z or a PE variable, right? Uh, you can have you can have two things um, uh, having an impact in later uh, period. How does that look? So when one estimates this model, um, one gets, gets these coefficients delta j. Um, so this is the immediate impact of um, a one-time uh, change in the, uh, in, 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 the, in the Z, let's say, um, or in the PE in this example, um, uh, on the fertility rate, um, this is the effect one year later, this is the effect two years later, and three years later. Now let's turn to um, the properties of OLS for time series data. What you see here is a set of assumptions under which OLS behaves basically in the same way as it does for cross-sectional data. And when you put these assumptions side by side, the assumptions you have seen for the uh, multivariate linear model, um, then you see um, a close similarity, but you also see some differences. So um, the first assumption, TS1, is um, that the stochastic process follows a linear model. Okay, so um, the variable, uh, the outcome uh, that we're looking at, uh, at time t, is a model that is linear, is given by a model that is linear in the parameters, an intercept term, then you have basically k axis and an error term. And the stochastic process is um, all the axis and the y at all times. The second assumption is very similar to um, what we have seen before. The second assumption is that there is no perfect collinearity. So what that means is that no x is a linear combination of all the other x's. And no x is constant because then uh, we would have two constant terms in the model. 
The third assumption, in a way, is the main assumption that we need. This is really what makes it all happen and uh, what allows us um, to give an interpretation to the results. This assumption is the zero conditional mean assumption. And in the context of time series data, here what we have is a very, very strong assumption. This is called strict exogeneity. And when you look at this uh, a bit more closely, then you see um, that this is actually different. Uh, so if we would take the exact analog of what we had before, uh, then we would write down that the expectation of ut given xt is equal to zero. What we do right now is we, we have like this big fat uh, letter x here without a t, and that is actually denoting all a matrix that contains all the x's in all periods t. Okay, so it's much, much stronger uh, than what we had before, because what we assume is that the expectation of ut um, does not depend on any of the x's in any of the time periods that we have, including, of course, uh, time period t. It's always going to be equal to zero, um, implying, of course, that uh, the expectation of ut unconditionally is also zero. Assumption four is, um, again, very similar to what we had before, homoscedasticity, with the one difference um, that now it's conditional on all the x's. Okay, so the variance of ut does not depend on any of the x's, also not on an x um, 15 periods in the past or five periods in the future. Um, no x uh, will predict uh, the variance of the ut. When you now um, actually put them side by side, you see that the counting is a little bit different. Um, uh, and that has to do with the fact uh, that, um, that uh, we have this extra assumption here, no serial correlation, um, that replaces the sampling assumption that we had before, uh, that all data come from are sampled from the same uh, same model, basically. Um, so what we have here is no serial correlation. What does that mean? That means the correlation between two U's in two time periods T and S, actually in any two time periods T and S, is zero conditional on all the X's. So once I condition on X, there's zero correlation between these U's. And the last assumption is normality we basically need it for the same reason, or we use it uh, in the same way as we did before. Um, and it is here that the UTs are independent of all the Xs. That's different, all the Xs instead of the X in the same time, time period, and independently and identically distributed uh, as a normal um, with mean zero and variance sigma square. Um, and that is used uh, to get exact distributions of estimators as before. And now all I'm going to give you is um, uh, an overview over um, the way uh, things are under these assumptions. Okay, and that you will see that there is there's really a parallel uh, to what we have seen before. First thing, theorem 10.1 and biasness of OLS. So the general gist is that OLS works fine under these assumptions. Okay, uh, so let me go into detail by, by going through these theorems. Uh, theorem 10.1, unbiasedness of OLS. Um, so under the first three assumptions, we have that um, uh, beta j hat in expectation is equal to beta j, unbiasedness. Theorem uh, 10.2, that is about the distribution of the estimator um, under assumption 1 through 5. Um, we get um, an expression for the variance of beta hat that is very, very similar. Uh, that is basically the expression we had before uh, for cross-sectional data. Theorem 
is about um, estimating the variance of the use. Again, we make assumption one through five. Um, and under these assumptions, what we do get is um, that an estimator uh, is given by the sum of uh, squared residuals um, divided by uh, the degrees of freedoms. And that's an unbiased estimator of sigma square. Again, Gauss-Markov theorem will actually hold. Um, it's not a big surprise because these assumptions are more or less the assumptions we saw before translated into the time series context. So um, under assumption one through five, the OLS estimator is actually the best linear unbiased estimator. When I now add assumption six, normality, um, then as before, not a big surprise, each T statistic has an exact T distribution, each F statistic has an exact F st uh, distribution, um, the usual construction of confidence intervals is valid, and um, the OLS estimators are exactly normally distributed. And what I talked about before is um, uh, the example uh, in Wooldridge, uh, that is example 10.4 on page 354, and that was the effect of personal exemption on fertility rates. Now, let me go back quickly uh, to these assumptions um, and discuss uh, why things are the way they are. So basically what you see here is that we need assumption one through five um, uh, for the um, distribution of the estimator and we need assumption one, through f uh, one, two, and three without four and five for the unbiasedness. Okay, so if we only care about unbiasedness, we need less assumptions. And that's exactly what we had before. And you see this um, when you look at these assumptions, right? Uh, so uh, the first assumption is really just a functional form assumption. That is what we had before. So somehow we need to say, oh, this is the this, this sort of class of models uh, within which uh, we, we, we look at, um, we think of, we think we are in that class of models. Uh, so that's in a way, uh, a starting point of the analysis. Assumption number two is a more or less technical assumption, no perfect collinearity. The key thing is assumption number three. Okay, so the zero conditional mean. And when you look at four and five, you see already that this is about um, the variance of the use. It's not important um, for estimating the betas um, in an unbiased way what the variance of the use is and also how these U's are correlated with one another is really not important for um, getting unbiased estimates of these betas. It is, however, important. Um, both assumptions are important for efficiency of the estimator. When they do hold, as before, um, we get um, uh, the blue uh, property. So then OLS will be the best linear unbiased estimator. And then when I add assumption number six, I get these extra benefits of normality and the, these will be that uh, the estimator is exactly normally distributed instead of being asymptotically normally distributed. This is also something we have discussed before in the course that when you have large samples, you don't need normality, then um, the estimator um, of, of a beta uh, will converge uh, uh, to a normal distribution. And that is based um, on a very fundamental result in statistics. And that fundamental result in statistics is that averages um, uh, are asymptotically normally distributed. Good. So uh, this really already gives you uh, the gist and the gist is in principle, you can use OLS 
with time series data, you need to state the assumptions in a different way. Um, but the key assumption remains um, uncorrelatedness between the regressors and the error term. And that is implied by this um, zero conditional mean assumption. Um, that was assumption three here. Um, and this zero conditional mean assumption um, now has conditioning not only on xt, but on all the x's in all time periods. To be extra sure that everything is fine, uh, one can weaken that, but that is then um, context specific. The next thing I want to talk about is um, spurious regression. That is something that always comes up um, when one talks about uh, time series data. Um, so um, think about the following. You have two time series um, and you regress one um, on another. Okay, so let's say um, one thing goes up and the other thing goes up, or one thing goes down and the other thing goes down. And what you will see is that the T statistics um, will say, you know, like um, uh, things are strongly significant. Uh, so you get very precise estimates. Um, uh, but something somehow isn't right. Um, so the question is, why does OLS actually fail in such a case? Uh, so think about these assumptions, one, two, three, four, five. Which one doesn't hold? Keep that thought. I'll get back to that. Um, but before I do, let me just show you uh, an example from this website here. Spurious correlations. Um, you can look at it yourself. Um, so let me just go there. Um, this would be an example, okay? So you have two time series, a red one and a black one. The black one is margarine consumed. And for the black one, you have um, the uh, y-axis on the right here. And for the red one, the divorce rate, you have the y-axis on the left, okay? Now, you see already both um, are basically going down, right? So there's less and less margarine consumed and um, in Maine, um, less and less people are getting divorced. Um, when you now regress one on the other, what you will get is a positive coefficient, right? So uh, the divorce rate will predict uh, margarine consumption or the other way around, right? Uh, so margarine consumption also predicts the divorce rate. So think for yourselves, what is really going on here? Like, um, does that mean that one has an effect on the other? And the answer, of course, is rather not. Okay, so think of these assumptions here. And we can actually say, what is going wrong? Um, uh, in terms of these assumptions. So what I would start with is uh, by saying, you know, all suppose all I care about is unbiasedness of my estimator. So then I don't actually have to look at assumption four and five, right? Because I've told you that for unbiasedness, you only need one, two, three. And you see that by just going back, right? Uh, so unbiasedness, I need one, two, three. That's all I need. So the question is, um, which one is the one uh, that is violated here? This is all not about linearity, okay? This is also not about collinearity. So the only one that can really be uh, the culprit uh, is this zero conditional mean assumption. And we have talked about um, uh, failures of this assumption before in the course. And what is really going on here is, um, that we just have omitted an important variable. And what we have omitted is a time trend in both processes. And I will get back to that um, in a minute. For now, keep in mind uh, that um, it is assumption number three that does not hold. Before I get back to this uh, example, 
let's move to the last part of this presentation. This is about trends and seasonality. Uh, let's just look at time trends uh, more generally. This is taken from the book, figure 10.2, output per labor hour in the United States. And what you see is that output is going up over time. And what we would call this is um, basically a linear time trend. You see essentially a linear function here in time. What we have here is nominal US imports during the years 48 to 95 in billions of US dollars uh, plotted over time. And what you see here is not a linear time trend. What you see here is um, can be called an exponential time trend. And what does exponential mean? Um, it does mean that essentially we look at growth here, right? So if, if something grows at a constant rate every year, um, 2%, um, then uh, it will look like this. Okay, so many things uh, actually grow exponentially. Stock prices, house prices, um, prices for stuff. Um, and also when you think about it, we measure inflation in, in terms of rates, right? Uh, prices have gone up by so and so many percent. Um, and, and keep that in mind uh, when it comes to actually specifying a regression equation uh, in your own work. Um, most of the time, uh, a particular type of specification works very well. And I'm going to get there actually right now. Um, so the linear trend looks like this. All you would do actually to uh, estimate a model with a linear trend is to, you would say that yt is given by an intercept plus alpha 1 times t really, right? Uh, so plus et. And that would be the error term. Now I'm coming to the exponential trend. Um, so when um, growth is exponential, then it means that actually the log of growth is linear. And this is exactly what we're leveraging here. Okay, so uh, for exponential growth, um, all you have to do is you have to use the log of yt on the left hand side it turns out that in many, many, many economic applications, um, this specification works really well. Um, the most famous one is probably uh, uh, the Mincer, or one of the most famous ones is the Mincer wage equation, where one would uh, actually uh, put the log of the wage on the left-hand side, not in, time, uh, not in a time series context, but in a cross-sectional context, but there it works really well. Um, but also in a time series context when you look at uh, the evolution of prices or GDP or uh, other things over time, uh, a log specification works really well. And um, you see that you have to do that by basically looking at the data. And when you get this, uh, this shape like that, uh, then you know that a log specification might work really well. Um, you can also have other specifications that are in some sense more complicated or more flexible. For instance, a quadratic time trend. And what you would do is you would do the linear time trend and then you would simply add um, a square term uh, of t uh, into the model. Now let me get back to uh, the spurious regression problem. One way of solving it uh, is, is actually very simple. So my story was that both time series had um, uh, a time trend, right? So when you look at this, um, this looks pretty much like a linear trend or you can put a quadratic trend. Um, so all you have to actually do is to um, put that trend into the model. Uh, and if the time series you wanna uh, analyze um, is uh, yt and the other one is xt and x, uh, yeah, so that would be xt1, uh, and here you have something else, uh, whatever, seasonality, Christmas, and so on. Um, and then all you have to do is to put time into the model, and you can uh, start with linear time trend, um, and you can then add like a quadratic and a cubic term, and so on and so forth, and see what remains, basically. And what you will see is that this um, coefficient on the other time series will actually go down. And 
what you see here on the slide, second to last point. This may also be useful if YT is not trending itself, but uh, basically the other process that is in uh, XT1 uh, is uh, trending or when XT2 is yet another one, uh, so when both of those are trending. Um, take care. Uh, last point, the usual R squared might be artificially high, right? Uh, so when you estimate this model here, you, you can predict YT incredibly well. But most of the prediction is going to come from this, from this uh, variable here, which is the time trend, right? So um, you're making a mistake when you're saying you really understand uh, what drives YT, because essentially what you're saying is that um, time is uh, uh, time is driving YT. But when you say that, you're not really understanding what is driving it. So be careful. And finally, um, if you know um, that there is not only say, a gradual development over time, but that certain events um, uh, do um, have an effect or certain seasons uh, do have an effect, um, then what you can do is you can put lots of um, dummy variables into the model um, to control for these seasonal effects or to predict um, what will happen, um, you know, how, how the Y is different on Mondays, how the Y is different during summer holidays, um, how the Y is different um, two weeks before Christmas, Christmas, and so on and so forth. Yeah, and this is already actually uh, what I had um, for a first take uh, on uh, time series analysis um, using uh, the very um, simple OLS model. Um, so what you see is that the main takeaway uh, from my side here is that OLS works just fine under the right assumptions. Um, there are certain things that you need to be careful with. Um, one is spurious regression, so you need to put your time trends into the model and you should be careful uh, not to overinterpret a high R squared measure, but by and large, um, it could well be that also with time series data, uh, things work just fine. With that, all the best. <laughs>